Welcome to another episode of Safe on the Water. We're calling today's episode When the Horn Blows, and it's about the vessel traffic system in San Francisco Bay and, and areas beyond. Uh, we are always on the lookout how to provide small boaters, in particular, with safety tips. And we're very, very fortunate today to have a gentleman who knows all about that. His name is Scott Humphrey, and he's a trainer. He uh, has worked with the auxiliary and the public, and he's here today to share a lot of good tips. Scott, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your background? Are you a local Bay Area person? Are you imported from some other city? Uh, what brings you to the Bay? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having us out here, Barbara. We really appreciate this opportunity. I grew up in Virginia. I decided to join the Coast Guard back in 1983. Graduated from high school and got to thinking, I want to do something different and move out of the area. Joined the Coast Guard, was active duty for nine years, loved the organization, ended up stationed here in the Bay Area and loved this area, kind of said, I want to stay here. Okay. And got out of the Coast Guard, now I work for them as a civilian. So can you tell us what VTS stands for? VTS stands for Vessel Traffic Service. Mm -hmm. And that uh, area that you cover, it sounds like you control the flow of boats well, in the bay? Or? in a way. The word control is kind of uh, <laughs> loosely used in the definition of a vessel traffic service. We have uh, surveillance over shipping from about 40 miles out to sea, all the way up to the port of Sacramento and Stockton, nearly 100 miles inland, down to Redwood City. Mm -hmm. We take big ships, tugs, and ferry boats. We keep track of them, report their position to other vessels. Basically try to keep ships moving around the bay so they don't run into each other. Well, that sounds like a huge area. Are you involved in commercial traffic lanes outside of the Golden Gate then? Uh... We rely on the mariner to make sure they stay within the traffic lanes. We give advisory broadcast and, and uh, advisory information. We tell ships about other ships, and we serve as an extension of their team. Fantastic. Well, we have uh, some video that we're going to show of what the vessel traffic service looked like before you got modern, and, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to compare the old and the new on today's show so that people can see how their tax dollars are at work, improving and looking out for the safety of people. And um, if you can help us narrate those as, as we're ready to show them, we, we would appreciate any comments you have. But it was a very cumbersome but apparently effective way because I think the safety record is pretty good. We have a video that we're showing right now um, that appears that you've got the electronics, the, the tower. It's a, it's a beautiful spot. Yeah, we have a, a great spot in the Bay Area. We're out on Yerba Buena Island, right mm -hmm. in the middle of the Bay Bridge, and the Coast Guard still owns a little wedge of Yerba Buena Island in our uh, offices up at the top. Um, uh, from Yerba Buena Island, we have radar coverage of the uh, entire Central Bay down into the South San Francisco Bay. And we've just recently expanded our radar coverage to cover ships all the way up to the uh, Carquinas Bridge. Wow, that's great. This is a, is a gorgeous day depicted here. Uh, and of course, the bridge going into San Francisco, we've been witnessing. And uh, uh, the facility itself is positioned whether good or bad it can still do its job we have some auxiliarists who are taking a tour this particular day and uh, uh, they were really treated to all these wonderful vistas you can certainly see visually rather than relying on equipment a lot of the traffic on a good day but i know that you've got uh, more modern equipment in now as, as we speak compared to what used to be. Yes, I believe even since this video was shot, we've uh, actually done a little bit of expanding onto the building to accommodate some of the more modern equipment. We are uh, using a lot of computers. I think we'll see that in a clip later on. But uh, to accommodate these new computers, we actually had to build a little bit more onto the building. Well, I always uh, look for an opportunity to talk about the Coast Guard Academy. We have a program going on right now, which is the AIM program, and we were able to take potential candidates up there and we make sure they all get indoctrinated into the service that you provide and then at the academy I know they have state-of-the-art equipment to teach uh, them how to you know interpret the radar and and identify the vessels and understand it all here I guess is it's what's happening uh, this auxiliary group is getting a tour and explanation of all the systems and the area of responsibility 
That's see the true. charts. We have, a, uh, we have a very aggressive outreach program at mm. VTS San Francisco, and it's, I'm glad you found a, a good clip with some people in it that uh, don't work there because mm -hmm. we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of visitors coming up every year, and, and we believe that we could be the best kept secret in the Bay if we're not careful, and we really don't want to be. It's important to let the citizens see where their tax dollars are being spent. Well, I know the parking, parking is limited up there and the space is very small. Under this old system, it shows how uh, they track on the boards. You said you think you've donated that board to the oil spill? I can't remember, to be perfectly honest, under the gun who we gave it to. I want to say it had to do with the state of California. And uh, I know uh, it was a great tool for seeing the entire VTS area all at once but uh, we just didn't have room for it with the new computerized equipment. Now we can see the cards that when a ship comes into your area, I guess a card was made out in the old days, exactly. and then as its position changed, you'd move the card on down the line. Uh, is, am I interpreting that right? You are uh, right on track with that. In fact, the, the operator would watch the radar video, as you see some radar there, and they would put a card on a tabletop as if in the World War II plot board to try to correlate that vessel's position with uh, what they were seeing on radar. Well, I'm always amazed at what uh, my ancestors had to go through, you know, in, the, in World War II and in the post-war type military operations uh, contrasted with what my generation knows now in terms of computers. I guess we'll see the updated version of this a little later in the program, but but even with this system, it shows how you can see, I guess that's a view right there on, out onto the bay. That and was there's probably from our Yerba Buena Island camera. I feel mm -hmm. sure it was. And uh, that's just above the tower that we saw in the earlier shot. Now, what is on the tower that we, we saw? There are two radar antennas. Uh, most people have seen them for years driving across the Bay Bridge. Two, and should, one should only be turning at a time. Mm -hmm. And we've got three cameras and those cameras can be panned and tilted uh, basically to cover the full central bay. Now, I remember in times of earthquakes, sometimes those dishes or whatever can get a little um, out of kilter, but one of the advantages of your location is you could run outside and take a look if there's something serious happening, but what do you do in terms of earthquake with regard to that equipment if it gets thrown off? Well, we consider communications to be our ultimate tool. When radar fails and cameras fails, the communications are pretty much the, uh, the things that we really need to get the job done. In the event of an earthquake, if the radar was damaged, we lost our microwave links, we still have our radios, hopefully, and we would maintain positions on vessels by getting information from them. Okay, that's great. We, we just have a few more seconds of this first video, and uh, I think you can see the little dots there that represent the ships in the bay, the white is landfall where That's correct <laughs> and then of course the bridges are more of that white solid line going across but this is great this is shot by tron miller our producer and uh, in conjunction with some of the auxiliarists so kind of now. nostalgic to look back at some of the uh, ways it used to be there and i was there that very day i think so i kind of remember that yeah well now let's get right to the point in the title of the show okay when you're out on the bay and you're on a small craft and you hear this big blaring horn from a huge ship coming in. Why are they leaning on the horn? Why wh do they, they want us to get out of the way or what's going on? Well, that's a very good question and uh, I'd like to kind of uh, answer that question with a little bit of an analogy, something I use. I want you to do an experiment for me. The next time you're in San Francisco, walk up to the side of the Transamerica building, and tilt your head back and look straight up. What you're going to be looking up the side of is an 850 foot long structure. That's what the captain on, br on the bridge of one of these ships sees when he's coming into the harbor. If you take one of these Maersk container ships, I'll use them as an example because I happen to know their length is about 980 some odd feet. If you took one of those ships and you stood it up in downtown San Francisco, it would tower over all the skyscrapers in the city. Well, that's pretty impressive. I've been up on the top of uh, one of those skyscrapers right in the middle of downtown, and uh, it's scary just to look down. So that's a good, a good example. What kind of vessels have to report into VTS? The type of vessels that have to report fall into three categories, and they're required by federal regulations. Power-driven vessels, 40 meters in length or more. It's about 126 feet. Towing vessels, 8 meters in length or more. And passenger vessels certificated to carry 50 or more passengers. 
even if they're just carrying one. So basically all the ferry boats on the bay. These vessels have to report to us before they move in the bay. Well, does that include recreational boaters and fishermen? No, it doesn't, uh, but recreational boaters and fishermen can benefit greatly from our service. I tell most recreational boaters to treat us like they would treat uh, the KCBS or their, uh, their weather uh, traffic station that they listen to on the radio. About 30 minutes before they get underway, before they leave the dock, turn on VTS on channel 14 if they're inshore or channel 12 if they're offshore and just listen. They'll know where all the ships are by the time they leave the dock. Well, we're going to be putting some more video up for our audience to see, and, and uh, if you could help me okay. narrate over this one. Uh, we've got it just about ready to roll here, so uh, it'll be an added attraction for the audience to see some more of the actual system. Okay. What we're seeing now is our old operations center. and. Uh, this was a video was shot to show how much movement, how much uh, actual the person moving around, filling out cards was necessary in the old system. You'll notice that board that uh, keeps coming up on the right, the uh, yellow colored board. That's how we tracked vessels upriver. Um, this operator had, was so busy this day that she had to push her chair back out of the way and just walk around the, the board. You were describing earlier how we laid the cards out on the tabletop. You can see the cards laying on the tabletop, the radars in front of the cards, Part of her job is to correlate the position of those cards with the, the video on the radar. She actually was uh, staffing three radar scopes. The old system required a separate radar scope for each radar antenna. Is this a high stress job? Uh, it seems like there's an awful lot of traffic in the bay. It has periods of high stress and it has periods of, of rest. And uh, when, it's, when it's stressful, it's very stressful. There's a lot going on. And it really requires an operator to maintain their cool and, uh, and just take care of business. Well, when approached by a larger vessel, does a smaller vessel call Channel 16 and, and say, hey, I'm, I'm here? Or, or well, I'm glad you asked that because, in fact, no. Uh, that's something that's probably one of the most misconceived uh, notions in the, in the pleasure boat community. As of 1994, the big ships, the tugs, and the ferry boats are no longer required to be on Channel 16. If they're participating with our VTS, they have to be on channel 14 and channel 13. If you think you're in uh, arm's way from a big ship, go for channel 13. Pick up the radio and attempt to establish communications with them. If you try on channel 16, it's quite likely that uh, they won't be there. Well, we're talking channels here like this is a, a marine transceiver and on your marine radio it's that channel that we're really talking to people dial to. It's important for them to know when they get out there on the water how to use these radios. And so um, we're going to show in a little bit here what the center looks like okay. uh, in more modern times. Great. And so we have... Uh, Actually, we're looking at a computer display now. The old radars that you saw the, uh, with the turning antennas have been replaced by computerized displays. You can see little icons representing the tracks. Each of the consoles there, uh, has 20, uh, two 21-inch computer displays in front of it. They control the cameras now by these little touch screen pads. You can see him touching the uh, orange small pad on the right side. When he touches the pad, the monitor moves, or the camera moves on top of the tower. The monitor stays stationary. We're seeing the Golden Gate Bridge there in the uh, middle of that uh, monitor. And we have basically uh, 360 degrees of coverage with those cameras on the Yerba Buena Island Tower. That's Treasure Island that we're looking at. Boy, I know everybody was so happy when they converted to the computer system and the anticipation of it was real, real high. It was something, let me tell you. It, there, there's an added stress involved in that in some ways uh, because you've, you're dealing with computers and there's a computerized form. Those paper cards were replaced by these electronic forms. This typist is pretty fast. It takes some good typing skills to get that information in there as fast as it's being reported. Well, uh, then do you store these in, in files, keep it on hand for 30 days, you know, all the movement? And yes, we do. Uh, we keep uh, everything on file, uh, on record, and uh, I'm not sure the exact duration. I believe it's a lot longer than 30 days, actually. And uh, we're able to retrieve most of this information. Well, did you store the cards from the old days? Like yes, that? we did. Oh. I believe we stored those cards for several years, and we had huge filing cabinets filled with those paper cards, and I believe we still do. Amazing the difference that uh, storing a little floppy disk can be compared to roomfuls of, 
of paper. I, I look forward to the paperless office and it's, it's good to know the Coast Guard's right up there with the modern uh, age and keeping us informed, you know, electronically. We're certainly working on it. Okay, take for an example, I know that we had a guest on, Captain Henderson, who's the um, commanding officer, Marine Safety Office, which yes. you're affiliated with. Uh, and we will be showing addresses and emails uh, during the program and, and boating safety hotlines that people can call. But one of his examples that you might help me expand on is uh, when, a, when a big ship confronts a small ship, we, we want to know, do sailboats have the right of way over a big ship if they're under sail in that kind of a circumstance? Not always. Uh, rule 9 comes into play, and Rule 9 says that if you're a sailing vessel or a power-driven vessel that's less than 20 meters long or a fishing vessel, and you're in a narrow channel or fairway, you have to get out of the way if a big ship or tug and barge is coming along, if that big ship or barge can't get out of that channel. The captain of the port has declared virtually every uh, navigable ship channel in the Bay Area as a narrow channel or fairway. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, that's uh, not a good rule of thumb. Maybe on the open ocean or in a giant open body of water, but uh, generally vessels should keep out of the way of big ships, small vessels. Now rule nine is something you're very comfortable talking about. For the public to get more information about that, uh, do you have a brochure or a handout? Yes, as a matter of fact, the Marine Safety Office at San Francisco has put together a, a great little brochure that describes Rule 9, and uh, I believe it lists the places that are considered narrow channels and fairways and exactly what vessels should do uh, when they're in these narrow channels and fairways. And I believe we've had an address that they can write to to get such a thing. Yeah, we will be displaying the address then. I um, am constantly amazed that you can just get in your boat and pilot it away without the same kind of scrutiny given to somebody getting in a car and doing it. And I think it behooves all the boaters to take advantage of, of whatever public education classes are offered through the auxiliary or to, you know, get information like your office is handing out this Rule 9 brochure, which has a map on it perhaps showing where these narrow channels are. Yes, and, it does. And it's just for the own safety of the boater and their passengers, you, you would want to stimulate the public to take advantage of all that's out there. Also, uh, you have a website, I believe. We do. Uh, VTS San Francisco has a, a website. Our executive officer, uh, Pete Marsh, put the website together and it has some interactive uh, things on it. You can click on uh, icons and see what our displays look like. You can hear actual audio of vessels communicating so that a, a, a ship or a tug might be able to get an example of what their calls should sound like. It also has links to web pages that have these rules on them. If the mariner's concerned and want, wants to get some more information about the different rules, they can go there and at least get them started uh, well, down these roads. Well, that is great. Uh, um, we'll be showing that website address too. And um, I hope that people will take advantage of it. It it's, sounds like real high tech. I'm, I'm excited about the future that my children and their children will have in terms of just instant access to all this information that can yes. really make a difference. Um, now, if I'm a small vessel, uh, we've got a, a display here we're going to put on in a, a few seconds. And I, I say, well, if you've got all this technology, why can't you just, when you see me on your screen, alert the big ship and redirect them away from me? So I think you brought a little uh, I sure did. video insert we'll take a look at here in a minute, and maybe you can answer that question for us. I think I can. Okay, great. We'll roll that. What we're looking at is a computerized version of our radar display, and if you look on the left side of your screen, you see a straight up and down line. That's the Golden Gate Bridge. Notice the mass of, of little dots just to the right of the Golden Gate Bridge. That's hundreds of pleasure boats. Hundreds. Hundreds, maybe more than hundreds. <laughs> There's quite a few of them out there that day. We can see them, but we couldn't begin to tell them apart, and that's what the captain on the big ship is seeing as well when he looks at his radar. Mm -hmm. This mass of small targets. This was actually opening day on the bay, 1994. Okay. Fortunately, I don't see any big ships passing through there. Maybe they made some good judgment calls not to move that day. I know during America's Cup uh, down in San Diego, it was 
handy finally that they had some sort of radar because one of the Navy vessels came out of the fog and came right upon this whole drama being played out uh, with the America's Cup. So uh, communication is really a, a lifesaver. If you've got it working, it works really good. Yes, it is. Now, what could small boats do to stay out of the way of big ships or towing vessels? Because uh, we realize if you're being towed, you don't have control. I have a general four-step process that if they perform this, they'll pretty much be safe, I feel sure. First and foremost, keep out of the way if at all possible. Think about the fact that that captain is looking down the side of that skyscraper and you look like a little bird in the water in front of him. It's very difficult to see you. If you have to get in the way, stay aware of your surroundings. Listen for fog whistles. Watch radar if you've got it. Listen to VTS. Third, listen to VTS. Listen on channel 14 if you're inshore, channel 12 if you're offshore. You'll hear where the big ships and ferry boats are. Things will be taken care of. And lastly, if you get into peril, contact the ship on channel 13. Don't wait until the last minute. Many pleasure boat operators, I think, feel intimidated sometimes about calling the big ships. Make sure the big ship knows who you are, because remember, they're looking out into that field of tiny little dots. Call them on channel 13 and establish some kind of arrangements with them. If it's nothing but to tell them that you're there, it might save your life. Now, I have a friend who was going to sail around the world, and they departed the Golden Gate. And as night fell, they were um, uh, noticing that there was a big vessel coming down on them. Now, she had uh, weather printouts, you know, the fax type weather printouts. She could see that this vessel was there, and they didn't think that they were in a shipping channel. And they tried radioing this vessel, which turned out not to be an American vessel. It was. Uh, actually another country and I won't name it. <laughs> right. Uh, and it didn't appear that that vessel either received their communication or or cared because uh, and her feeling was that it was perhaps the commercial aspect of getting the goods to market on time prevailed over a small little 32 foot sailboat. Uh, she tried very diff you know very hard to get out of the way in time but by the time they had discovered this uh, convergence that they were on in, in their course it was extremely lucky that they were to, able to just just escape but when you're trying to communicate with foreign vessels uh, how do you do that is it the same way Every small boat uh, operator that I've talked to, or every group of small boat operators can tell me a story about uh, some close call that they had, and it's really kind of frightening when you think about that. That's not an uncommon uh, problem. Uh, when you're dealing with foreign masters, foreign uh, vessels operating uh, out on the open ocean, you've got to plan even further in advance. You have to keep uh, m even more aware of your surroundings. You have to plan for the possibility that they might not have a, f a bridge, uh, opera, uh, someone up on the bridge that speaks clear English. You might have to start making these plans early. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask you about the language problem because you know, it, we have international codes for distress. Does that, is that right? I mean... That is true. I mean, it doesn't matter if you speak French or Italian, if you say mayday, mayday, or whatever, they're going to understand this is a problem. Yes. Mayday is a, a, is a term that should be reserved for <clears throat> absolute emergency. That's like calling 911. When you're trying to contact a vessel, establish that early communications, and things shouldn't get to the point where you have to get to mayday. If you're hit, if your vessel is uh, taking on water or you're in serious danger, that's when it's time to call Mayday, and that should be done on Channel 16. But that term should be reserved for a uh, real peril only. Now, she felt she was in peril with the convergence course and her inability to get out of the way as quickly as she uh, hoped. Uh, is that a, uh, an emergency in, in reality? Would that be viewed as an emergency? I think that would be a judgment call on the part of the person uh, on the vessel. Uh, we have some uh, tape recordings at VTS San Francisco that uh, show a vessel calling Mayday just before what turned out to be a, a major collision. So if you really believed that you were uh, doomed at that point, I would say that that might be a good time to call Mayday. That might be the last thing you get out over the radio. And uh, getting that out would cause people to become, you know, instantly aware of your situation. Now, how does um, a civilian wind up in charge of a facility like this? 
Well, it, a civilian isn't in charge of the whole facility. Okay. We have a military commanding officer and a military executive officer. I am uh, the training coordinator. I'm in charge of the training. I think my position uh, came down uh, partly as a result of uh, Open 90, which is a result from the Exxon Valdez grounding. Mm -hmm. They decided that they needed some full-time people to take care of training and education within the VTS. And we reach out to the maritime community as well. We work with the pilots frequently and with the shipping companies and ferry boat companies. Well, I've heard even though Valdez um, was such a tragedy that we seem to have learned from it and, and some good things have emerged even in terms of treatment of the cleanup that takes place. Uh, are you linked to then the, the disaster cleanup people? For instance, if you cannot prevent a collision, uh, you're probably one of the first to know. Do you have a, a direct communication where you can just at least get some emergency help out there right away? Yes, we're likely to be the initial responder, so to speak. The vessel is probably going to call us right after the collision and say, traffic, we've just been involved in a collision. We're going to get the balls rolling. We're going to talk to the Marine Safety Office, talk to the group, and uh, then, of course, they're going to take over the rescue. We're uh, ultimately going to try to keep other vessels clear of the area. Well, this is great. Now, uh, we're going to be displaying the address, you know, for people to come. And um, I'll just briefly make the comment that you have told me that the public is aware that okay. they can come and, and get tours, but you'd like them to call for an appointment uh, since it is a small facility. Yes. And, um, that's really great. We, we have about 30 seconds to, to wrap up here, but thank you so much for sharing all this information. And I, I know that you're doing a valuable service out there, and we thank our audience for joining us. Uh, please come again. We'll be uh, learning more about the Sea Partners and the Marine Safety Office, and we really appreciate the support that we've been given from uh, Captain Henderson in particular on this topic and others. So we'll just go ahead and roll the credits. And again, many thanks for bringing those wonderful inserts. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is a great opportunity for us as well. The public needs to know, and, and we're pleased to, to be of service. We, we know that they're out there wanting to do the right thing, and if we can help, that's, that's what we're here for. And certainly, anything we can do to, to help keep the public safe.